So, okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, for those of you, I don't think there's many here who don't know me. I'm Mindy Towsley. I'm the executive director here at the Artist Archives. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's so great to see everyone's faces. Um, so I'm just gonna, um, I'd like to thank our funders before we start. Um, I'd like to thank the Bernice and David E. Davis Art Foundation. We exist on the Art Foundation's campus. Um, I'd also like to thank the Ohio Arts Council, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the Gunn Foundation, and the Zufall Foundation, and all of you who have memberships here, thank you so much for your support. Uh, for those of you who are not members, you're in the midst of the members show. It is a non-juried exhibition. Everything has to be 24 inches and under. So it's open to all the artist members. So if you'd like to become a member, just uh, see me or Megan after the program and we'll get you set up. You can be part of it next year. So uh, there's some upcoming events. On Friday, May 5th, we have the annual meeting for the members, <clears throat> and we also will have a closing party after the annual meeting for this show. Um, so please uh, try and attend that. Um, we have our next opening, which is Thursday, May 18th. That's the Society for American Graphic Artists exhibition. Um, so that's printmakers. It should be a really great show. We also have a very special event happening on June 11th. I know some of you know about it already. It's a fundraiser for us. It's called the Egg and the Obelisk. And we have given out 71 ostrich eggs to artists who are doing amazing things with them. The only stipulation was take this egg and do something beautiful with it and bring it back to us. And that's it. So they are making sculptures. They are making paintings on the eggs. They are doing great things. I have one set up in the back that you can take a look at after. It's by Judith Solomon, ceramic artist. Um, she dropped it off yesterday and it was so great. I thought I'd leave it out just so you could get a little preview. We'll probably start doing some previews of finished eggs. Ticket price for that event is $200. And the way the event works is you start here at the archives and you get a clue and your clue will take you to the Lakeview Cemetery next door. And then you have to find the answer to the clue, which will be hidden in a plastic egg. We are not putting the finished sculptures in the cemetery. <laughs> yeah, but so, so, so it's kind of fun. So it's a scavenger hunt. And when you solve your clue, you get, you come back to the archives. We'll have all the eggs set up in the gallery in the front on Euclid Avenue. They'll be up for a week. And then you get to select your eggs. Um, if you'd like to participate, but you think you're gonna be out of town, um, just talk to us. Um, we're setting things up so that people who are out of town can also somehow get an egg. So, yes. I think I read this $200 ticket for two people. Yes, it is, yes, yes. So the two of you can solve your clue, yes. But you'll only get one egg. Yeah, one one ticket, one egg. But yes, if you if you have a helper, um, you know, if for some reason you can't um, you have issues and you can't walk around the cemetery, obviously, we're not going to send you too far into the cemetery. You're not going to be like traveling the whole cemetery. You've only got an hour and a half to do this. So if you have some kind of mobility issues, you can have a friend search for you if you like. Um, so, again, you know, there's there's different ways around things. So just please contact us. Tickets are available online. They're available through the office. You can charge them. You can give us a check. You can give us cash. Um, we'll take your money however you want to give it to us. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, so now um, Megan Els, our manager of marketing and programming, um, is going to introduce our special guests, Jamal Collins and Al Cowger, tell you a little bit about them and get the program started. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Megan Alves. I'm the Manager of Marketing and Programming here at the Artist Archives. So I'm going to keep things short because it is a big, awesome topic. But before we got started, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here. So AI is new technology. There's a lot of conversation around it. And what keeps our creative community strong and vibrant is learning about new things so that we can make informed decisions and opinions on our own. And yeah, see what's out there and see what's next. So that being said, thank you also to everybody who is on Zoom too. I'm gonna to give you a little bit about our presenters before we get started. First up, I'm gonna let you know about Jamal Collins. He is a highly skilled designer, an artist, and an educator 
with 10 years of experience teaching graphic design, marketing, videography, photography, and content creation. He is passionate about empowering young creatives, entrepreneurs, and business owners with the resources and skills they need to be successful in the creative field. Through his organization, the Creative Kids Group, which is proudly emblazoned on his outfit today, Colin provides an immersive and comprehensive visual education that fosters creativity, critical thinking, and social awareness. His programs for adults and children also include training on marketing, branding, promotion, and culminates in opportunities for individuals to showcase their work. Collins also offers workshops and coaching, teaching creative professionals how to grow their business. He has a robust social media practice. You all need to follow him immediately on all of his channels, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And he has a new podcast that is Loitering and Unarmed. Check it out, please. It is amazing. And then uh, there is a new Endeavor launch called Band, so Brand Crush Campus, too. And so we're going to make sure to put those links on our social media and there'll be a QR code at the end. And for Al Calger, so Alfred Calger actually was him up with the idea of having this presentation. Let us know. Calger is a sole practitioner who has served as an in-house counsel to a number of high-tech businesses, including those making commercial use of AI, and also has been a pro bono counsel on a variety of civil rights cases. He has written a number of articles, podcasts, and presentations on legal issues related to AI, including the threats of algorithms to AI and civil rights, legal remedies, and American jurisprudence, One Nation Under Algorithms, which is the best title ever. Like, I want to read that right now. Uh, Calgar is also a graduate of Cornell University and Case Western Reserve University Law School. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Jamal, who will start there. Then it'll be Al, and then we'll do questions at the end, just to let you know. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jamal. How's everybody? It was an error on that bio. It's 20 years of experience. I'm not that young. <laughs> One day. All right, so I'm going to talk about Mid Journey version five. An AI tool for creators, jworking.com is my uh, domain name. So back in August, I was on, um, oh, next slide, I'm sorry. I thought I was controlling. So back in August, I was just on Facebook scrolling and I follow a couple of my designer friends and this popped up and I was, I, I read it and I looked, that's like Cleveland, Final Fantasy. And I was kind of hearing some stuff about me at Journey. So it was kind of interesting to me. That's the Cleveland landscape. And I just saw some cool stuff. I was like, man, let me take a look at this and see what this is about. Next slide. So I go to midjourney.com and I see this crazy website. And I was like, what the heck is this? I'm like so busy. I don't really have time to look up something new. So I was just like, forget it. I thought it was going to be straight, you know, something simple for me to do. It looked kind of complex and complicated. So I was just like, nah, I'm going I'm to pass on it. So next slide. So then I come across um, some avatars that looked like this again on Facebook. So it's this app called Linza. And then Linza, they added a new component in there called the magic avatar. So in a magic avatar, you can upload like 10 to 15 pictures and it'll take those pictures of your selfies and it'll create different like genres, like kind of like, this is kind of like futuristic, uh, anime type style characters. And I saw this and I just shared this with my buddy. I was like blown away, like, because as a designer, I'm like kind of looking at different painting styles or something to like really, you know, you know, uh, maybe create some portraits of myself. And this was so fast to do, right? So I was like, well, let me look back into this mid journey stuff. Cause I had the bug. So next slide. So I'll go back into the mid journey. <laughs> so, uh, if you see down at the bottom, I was like, let me try this again. And you see down at the bottom, it says join beta. So I started playing around with, you can go to the next slide. I started playing around with the, the outputs that I got in Linza and the mid journey and mixing the two. Because at the, because at the time when I was, this was maybe a version four, we have to version five. So it could have been version three or version four. You couldn't really get your face in there like, like I wanted it. So that's 
some uh, Photoshop manipulation. I was using both of them. And you can't do text in Mid Journey, even with version five yet, but when version six come, you could do text too. So, so not yet. <laughs> so somebody asked me about the fish, like what's with the fish? Those are supposed to be sharks. So I was about, supposed to be like a king um, surrounded in sharks. I don't know what I was thinking. So you can, <laughs> you can, I'm just like a kid, just trying to be creative with stuff. So you can go to the next slide. So the next thing I know, this pops up. So as soon as I got the lens going on, I got the mid journey going on, and now I see all this anti, uh, this anti AI art, right? So um, Art Station is like a marketplace for designers, and you had a bunch of other designers and creatives that had work up there competing with this AI stuff, and it was just like the artist was banning against what was going on with this AI stuff. So I looked into this a little bit. And I really was, it was just like kind of bizarre that I didn't, I didn't know that it was grabbing different styles from other artists. So if I'm a famous artist, Jamal Collins, you could come in and type in Jamal Collins style and it'll grab some of my artwork, right? So this was like kind of uh, a, a crucial piece in, in this new technology and stuff. So you go to the next one. So I'm gonna just get into the agenda today. The agenda of the day, I'm going to kind of go over what is me a journey. I'm going to talk about how to do it. I'm going to talk about prompts. I'm going to talk about some more prompts, and then we can have some Q&A at the end. Cool? Okay. All right, next. So my objective is really so you can understand me a journey of uh, version 5 and how it works, learn about the AI-powered text prompts and how to create different images and explore various artistic styles and photography methods. Next, um, should I say next or should I say something? <laughs> Click. So what is Mid Journey? Mid Journey is an AI powered tool that you can use to generate art and graphic design and get different wide range of prompts and filters. And it's got over 600 prompts, but I think it's more prompts than that. Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, so Mid Journey power, uh, is a text prompt generator allows you to create different images in like a couple seconds. And then you could take that further into Canva or some Adobe Creative Suite where you saw me do it. So you can create like some backgrounds if you want. If you wanna kind of go over some ideas or something or some concepts real quick, you can. I had a case where I was looking for some images for a slide presentation and I was given some references about failing the launch and executing and things like that. And when I was looking for Google images to place into my PowerPoint, I couldn't find it. So I was able to get in mid journey and get the pictures that fit my PowerPoint presentation to a T. So that was kind of some of the things that I was using it for. All right, so we can go to the next one. So how it works is this is mid journey is currently being, you, you can use it through Discord, through a Discord bot. So this is uh, so Discord is like a server that you can create and it's running through there. So this is the Discord homepage right here. So you can generate images using the four slash imagine command, type in a prompt and you'll get four images. But uh, Discord is for any type of like club, gaming group. So you could, we could all create a Discord for this community too, right? So next. Somebody asked me, like, how much is this? <laughs> so, so, so it was free. You got the monthly, you got the yearly. So you got these different plans and you could generate a little bit faster with each plan. And underneath the $10 a month, you get like 200 plus images a month, right? Um, so we could go to next. So once you hit the beta, then you'll get access to get into the... the uh, Discord to run the mid journey bot. Okay, so once you get into the mid journey bot next. So once you sign up, this is kind of what the home page looks like. And when you first get in, it's a couple of different areas where it says newbie. So underneath newbie, you can type in your prompt and underneath your prompt, you'll get these images. But underneath the newbie is like kind of where everybody is. So it's kind of moving fast. So by the time it renders, the page may move up because you got a lot of people rendering these different images, right? So the thing is, is that you can create your own server within Discord, and then you could run your own 
uh, images inside of there. And then you can even niche down to like logos, to like paintings, to like whatever you're using it for. So you can have different servers within inside of there. Okay, so next. So you can see down at the bottom on that last slide, when you click forward slash where it says message right here, that's where you're able, it'll say, um, when you hit click forward slash, you'll see some, some things pop up and one of them will say imagine. So you click imagine and then you can type in your prompt. You can see what I put in. I put in King Tut, comma, Egyptian hieroglyphics, comma, sticker, and you can see the rest of my prompts right there. And then once it's finished, you get two rows and underneath those rows, you got some buttons. So you got uh, U1, 2, 3, 4, and that means upscale. And then you got the different versions at the bottom, version 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you start at the top, that's, that's, that's 1, 2, 3, 4. And then that small button over there is how you uh, rerun it, right? So if you want to rerun it, that same prompt, and you don't like the output that you got, you could rerun it again. So once you hit the upscale, it'll upscale to hit the next slide. So you can upscale it. And once you upscale it, you'll get a higher resolution of this version right here. So once you want to save this, you could just right click this and you can save this too. So you got two things going on. Once you sign up, so we got the Discord running the Midjourney bot, but also you have the midjourney.com. So midjourney.com is kind of where I was at where the pricing tier was. So you logged into there too, right? So once you have outputs of different images that you have, it'll also be at midjourney.com forward, forward slash app. So you can see all of your projects in there too. It's almost like a gallery of your portfolio. And you can also see other people's galleries in there too. You can follow different, um, you, you can follow different uh, design, well, not, I don't wanna call them designers. I don't, I don't even know if I'm calling them artists. No, we're, just, not. we're just playing around. <laughs> so, so I'll let you talk about all that stuff. <laughs> so, so in there, you could also see other people's prompts too, right? So, you know, we got this whole thing about like prompt engineering now and really getting uh, savvy with these different prompts, but I'm gonna kind of get into that later. So hit the next slide. So right here, we can see uh, just a raw direct prompt right here, a cowboy wearing a tuxedo on the moon. And this is kind of what you get right here. Okay, so I've seen, okay, no, this is okay. It's okay. So this is like the, the big circle in the middle was like your main prompt. And then the other surrounding uh, words are how you get your different effects. So you could put in an artist's name, you could put in effects, a camera lens and the rabbit hole goes as far as you want it to go. I've seen prompts as, as big as like paragraphs on different styles and you're just breaking up the prompts into like different commas and things like that. So it's the same thing with like when you're getting into chat GPT, that's all talking to the bot and I mean not the bot, but talking to AI and getting a different output that you want. So it won't do all the work for you. It will do a lot of the work for you, but you need to understand how to massage to get the answers that you want. So a lot of people in here messing with the chat GPT. Can I see hands? You know I'm a teacher. Can I see hands? Okay. <laughs> okay. So all right, next. So I'm gonna get into some advanced prompts. I'm gonna talk about style, stylized, chaos, resolution, aspect ratio, describe, weights on different prompts and filtering out words too. So this stuff is kind of gets crazy. All right, so next. So here's some different styles, right? Using keywords and sub styles based off of an art form, whether designer, artist, genre, and you can make your choice. So this is the same artwork right here. It's a dog with a flower in his mouth and you can see just a standard output. And then you have, you know, the dog with the, flower in his mouth, Japanese anime style, Pixar movie style. So you can pick all these different styles and you can see the same prompt getting a different um, output. And you could put in that same prompt again, you'll get a completely different output too, which is crazy. You don't always get the same thing. Silence your phones, please. <laughs> you know, I'm a teacher. Okay, all right, next. 
So this is uh, using keywords and subtitles to get different art forms. And you can see that you can forward slash imagine horse galloping on a sunset painting Andy Warhol, st Andy Warhol style. So you can see Da Vinci, you can see Picasso, you can see these different styles, right? <laughs> you could go to the next. So you can use, and then you could build these up. So you could do Andy Warhol, Pixar, and then you could start doing these lighting, lighting too. So you could stack up different, uh, different prompts on top of it. But usually you start with the main prompt on your main subject. So you don't start with the lighting, you kind of start with, you know, uh, I don't know, a dog, but you start with the dog or whatever the subject is. So you can see cinematic lighting, blue lighting, and these is all the same prompts with different lighting attached to it. You could go to next. So now you can add um, settings. So four slash, two slashes S with some number, and then you can get, different lows and high style options too. So you can see fire force slash firefight, fire, firefighters dash dash S with the 6,000. So when you kind of in there playing around and you seeing people in there, you're gonna see all kind of low like dashes and things like that. Like what the heck is that? So these are just like different prompts and stuff that you can put in there to add these different effects to what you want. Next, so you can add chaos. So you can increase, um, you can increase the chaos from zero to one hundred, and that's just for slash imagine Eiffel Tower dash dash chaos sixty. So you got to make sure that the dash dash is this. Um, I don't know if I got that. Do I got? I got. I got one of my companions in the audience. I don't know if. It, sometimes if the, I don't know if you need a space in between the chaos, I might have got a typo. So if you don't do it right, it may not give you that output. So I don't know if it's a, sometimes I got to check. And see. I kind of got it close to it, so I could be right. Okay, all right. So sometimes you got to just kind of look and see like, why is this working? All right, so next we got resolution. So you'll see the resolution at the end of the output too. So you could put a uh, photorealistic, 4K, ultra detailed. And then you could say uh, right here, four slash red rose flower quality five. Or you could put high resolution, you could put that in there too. So next you got aspect ratios, because when you first do a standard uh, output of an image, then you just get the standard 1.1 ratio. So if you want this to fit as a poster, landscape, or portrait, and you have to put in dash dash AR, and then you have to put in uh, that aspect ratio. Or if you wanted it to be at an exact size, you could put width and height. So if you go to the next um, picture, you can kind of see these aspect ratios going on too. So it's another third party app that you can use that you can take these and really make them high quality. Because if I wanted to print this or sell this as a print, I could. So you have to take this into another program and it'll make it a high quality image, high resolution, 300, and then you could print it. You got guys that are setting up Etsy stores with prints and putting these on the market and selling them and making a killing. I knew that would get y'all. I knew that would get y'all. So you got describe. So before before describe, you could put a picture in there and you upload a picture inside of your feed. So right where you hit four slash imagine, you could just copy and paste a link for a picture and put a picture in there and then it'll see the picture and then you can add prompts to the picture too. So then you can get an output of that. But they just added with version five something called describe. So now instead of when you hit forward slash, you'll see a bunch of stuff. You go down to describe and it'll have give you an option to upload a picture. You can click the next one. And now it'll automatically, when I put this bike in here, it'll give me three different descriptions of that bike. So it says, but so it's reading it and understanding what picture I stuck in there. It's stuck in the, there, the aspect ratio, the lighting the type of bike it is, the focus, and all of that stuff. 
So I don't even have to copy and paste this anymore. I could just hit one, two, three, four, and it'll automatically render and run that. So yeah, this is getting wild, right? <laughs> so um, you could add, I never really did this, my man back there, he's a scientist with the glasses on. Um, <laughs> Um, so you can add weight to prompts too. I really didn't get the output that I wanted, but you can highlight different, more important things. So how it works is if I wanted to, um, let's just say I was doing a red castle with flowers on a mountain and I wanted it to be more red, then I can uh, give more points to it. So the higher the points are, so you see I got zebra four, I got more zebras than I got lions. So you can you can actually, you know, get more importance to certain things if you want to. I don't know if it really worked all that good back. That was four. No, didn't work that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wanted to add this to it. This was something that this was something that I didn't know next. I didn't know that you could filter out stuff. So you we got some KFC. And if you, so if you don't want no sauce. <laughs> if you don't want no sauce, you could take uh dash dash no sauce and take it off. <laughs> so, all right, so next, this is the tuxedo again. This is the cowboy tuxedo on the moon, and I just added pop art to it. So that changed it from the raw image to pop art, and then I could pick one of those. I can upscale it. And you can see the aspect ratio on that is the, I think it's 19 by 6. Am I right? We are artists in here, right? Aspect ratio. Uh, the, the marketing person from the corner. <laughs> right. So 16 by 9. 16 by 9. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway. My man, I'm glad you're sitting up front. <laughs> Same thing right here next. Oh, I can't control it. So this is like impressionistic uh, landscapes right here. Same prompt. So you can see the difference that you could get, which is crazy, right? So the next one is just someone just to just kind of see different art styles and photography. So we got realism and we can stick all this in there. Hyper-realistic, precise details, block colors. You could use one, you could use them all. You could just, sky's the limit. You could just keep going if you wanted to. So we could go next. Um, you can input different painters in there too to get those different styles. So you could get, you could put Picasso in there, you could put Cubism in there, you could put all of these different things in here. So this kind of getting into like the different um, 600 prompts, right? So uh, we're going next. Okay, so photographers. What's your name? I'm gonna put your name up there. We could get his style, right? Photography, fashion, fine arts. We can pick the lenses, we can pick the angles. I need a top view, I need a bird's eye view because sometimes you might wanna show some shoes. So it might not show his feet. So then you gotta put the description of his shoes because it might just be a mid shot. So whatever type of shot that you want to put in there, you could do that. I'm seeing people do layouts for their houses, right? So I'm gonna change this room up some and I can upload a picture of it and change the way it looks architecture, right? So layout and stuff like that. So before we get the building, we can have AI output the way it looks and how we kind of envision it before we build it and put it into play. So this is like part of it. Next, anime styles, which I love, right? So all my stuff is probably look like some type of ghost in the shell and Astro Boy <laughs> something, <laughs> right? So anything you could think of next. So some of the key takeaways uh, for me, a journey is this, you know, suitable for graphic design purposes. You might not agree. Just don't. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a different uh, approach to creating art and design and just kind of getting into, I just wanted to get into some of the prompt generating capabilities to creating different images, um, explore those different uh, artistic styles, photography methods, things like that. Keep an eye out on for version six. It's always something new coming and going. Right, so just understanding the props and the different specific styles and artwork for photography. And then if you're kind of curious on, go to the next one. If you're kind of curious on like different prompts and things like that, 
then you know youtube has got all kind of stuff about mayor journey these different prompts there's the 600 different prompts and all the kind of stuff that you could do examples and things like that i don't know if i'm just speeding through my no, you're good you're perfect. oh okay yeah. okay cool so next um <laughs> Some craziness I kind of came up with. So jworking.com is my website. Also, if you want to go to the next one, if you want to, you want, hold on, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> I think he was moving. To, he, he, go back to back up one slide. <laughs> right. Are you going to go to the next one? Um, <laughs> Uh, if you want some updates, some emails and things like that, I have some stuff on jworking.com. If you want to grab this with your phone, she's going to put this in the show notes and stuff like that, too. Uh, it's just like an email list to get updates and things like that. So that's it for me. I may have some. Well, how long I got? Oh, oh never. Yeah, never, yeah. never. Thank you. Owl next because some of the questions might have come up and Owl might address and then at the end we'll do a total Q&A so hang on to those questions and another hand for Jamal if they hand it over to Owl. Yeah. So I'm going to be focusing on you as the artist are going to use this technology. What are your rights? What is your exposure? Uh, I have to preface this as saying I'm going to be talking about 15, 20 minutes tops. This is so complicated. Please don't assume any of this is legal <laughs> advice you can run with. Uh, <laughs> My uh, malpractice carrier would be very upset about that. Um, so let me quickly explain, and this is way too quickly, how artificial intelligence wor works such that it's able to develop the images you just saw. What it does is it collects information from databases. It may look at a million or a billion different images. And from that, it can draw various um, styles, lighting, whatever. And it can actually, the better programs can actually teach itself over time to make the images better. It can teach itself as to, if people start selecting one sort of lighting over another, what are the popular lightings? Why are some lights not as good? And over time, it, for example, if you put in um, Picasso style, it will over time teach itself to e become even a better Picasso stylist. Um, that's important to remember, I'll get, to that why in a few moments, but just think about these programs just grabbing whatever images and data related to that images right down the brush strokes to uh, come up with the art that uh, you can create through them. So the question then is, is what AI does art? This image here was by uh, Boris Edgaston. Has anybody read this story? Yeah, okay. He entered this in the Sony Worldwide Photography Awards competition. He's a well-known imagist. I'm going to use that term specifically. This was called Pseudomnasia Electrician. Um, he won this worldwide competition. He showed up at the award ceremony and said, I'm not accepting the award because this isn't a photograph. Um, he claimed to want to do this to educate the public and the professionals, such as the runners, the people running this competition, about what AI can do and what people better be aware that it can do. Um, he, in fact, said this met all the rules of the photography competition because the rules simply said you had to use a device to create an image. And he said, there's my device, my computer. Um, now, some people, some news stories said that he said this was not art, and he didn't say that at all. He said this is not a photograph. He said it is art, it is AI art. Um, but that then does beg the question, what art created by AI should be considered art? 
Now, I'm going to differentiate this from the aesthetic values, so to speak, and the legal aspects. Because frankly, I think anytime you're using AI to develop something that speaks to you, speaks to your audience, is just simply aesthetic. That is the very epitome of art. You're simply using AI as a tool, just like people would use a copper plate to make a print, um, oils to make an oil painting, uh, or a camera to make photography. So anybody that says AI is an art, I think is simply living several generations behind all of us. So that's one thing I think we need to keep in mind for people who say, well, AI is an art because you're just using a mechanism, you're just using software. I think that is, is very close thinking. Um, now, the Copyright Office, oh, before I go on to that, by the way, he, um, this artist said, Sony should have figured out that this was AI. And he didn't have to just tell them. For one thing, his biography stated that he is an AI artist. It didn't say he was a photographer. <laughs> Secondly, I Googled pseudomnesia, and that means fake memory. <laughs> so this is a memory that never existed of two generations of women. Uh, so he was giving them all the signals. They just didn't pay attention to it. Um, let's go on to what the Copyright Office has said. And for a long time, they said nothing. Um, they recently put out a, a statement, however, saying that art that is generated by AI is not copyrightable unless the human has significant input into it. Now, what the heck does that mean? I mean, Jamal just gave us a great 15 minutes on 600 different aspects you can put into it. Is that not human involvement? Yet the copy for what the Copyright Office was ruling on was a uh, comic book that was submitted. The art had been generated by AI. All the script had been generated by the author. They gave copyright protection for the verbiage and for the layout, but not for the art. Because they said she did not have sufficient input into the crea creation by the AI program that they consider that a human creation. Um, Going one step further, the Copyright Office said, oh, well, we originally granted her copyright because we didn't know that she used an AI program. From now on, we want all artists who are submitting uh, something to be copyrighted to tell us if they're using AI. I think, frankly, that begs the question. If they can't figure out you're using AI, then maybe they should be granting copyright because that's a creative process that, that deserves to have protection. So. The irony here is, in this photograph image, is that if you go back to the uh, 19th century when photography first became used by artists, it was not allowed to have copyright. Because way back when, the Copyright Office said, it's just the use of a mechanical device that has no artistic merit, no artistic aspects. Just what people are saying now, especially the Copyright Office, about AI programs. And in fact, it was Congress that had to step in to change the law to actually grant copyright protection to photographers because the Copyright Office refused. So I think you're gonna, as I talk, you're gonna hear that I keep referring back to history because I think even though we're talking about modern technology, a lot of these questions should and can be resolved by looking at historically how we've treated art. So the next question is, if something is indeed art, that at least arguably is protected or should be protected, who is the artist? Is that the next one? Oh, <laughs> next. <laughs> so, what the Copyright Office says is, if it's just the AI program creating it, even if a human was involved, we will not give copyright protection uh, because a human has to be the artist. Now, I bring this up because this is a fascinating story from about a decade ago, which I think could impact 
how people treat AI programs as, as the artist or part of the art, artistic process. This lady here is um, Naruto, or at least that's what PETA called her. An artist by the name of uh, David Slater, a UK photographer, set up a whole bunch of cameras along a path being used by macaque uh, monkeys in Indonesia. And eventually one of them picked it up and took a selfie. <laughs> and he made a few thousand pounds off of this, but then Wikipedia and a couple other sources online took that image and put it on and people used it all over the place for, on coffee mugs, on t-shirts, calendars, and paid him nothing. Um, he sued Wikipedia claiming they violated his copyright. Uh, the long and short of the story is the court eventually ruled he didn't take this picture, the monkey did. <laughs> and therefore, since no humans have, uh, uh, you have to be human to have a copyright, and the monkey was the artist here, this was not a copyrightable uh, visual. And uh, the poor man eventually basically went broke paying the attorney's fees to get to the point of trying to find out that he had no rights on this. So who is the artist? In this case, it was the monkey. You could use this as an analogy in a very bad way to say, well, just like the non-human monkey took their own picture and created this photograph, the non-human AI program is what generates the art and therefore they're not a human and therefore they're the artist, but the human isn't, so there's no copyright protection. Um, as an interesting side note, very quickly, Peta came on board while he was suing Wikipedia and claimed that they were representing the monkey and the monkey should have the copyright. <laughs> the, the Court of Appeals ruled the monkey had jurisdiction to bring the lawsuit, <laughs> but did not have rights under the copyright law to be considered the artist. So nobody won. Can we go to the next uh, slide? This is a painting called Edmund de Bellamy sold at Christie's in 2018 for $432,500, about 1,000 times above the estimate. This is the probably first known image of AI actually creating a, a uh, oil painting that was then sold to the public. Um, the way this was generated was, uh, you, remember when I said that uh, AI takes a whole bunch of images in a database and tries to figure out how to create art? Um, the instruction of the AI program was come up with something that looks like a Georgian era portrait. And there was one software program called the generator. And there was another software program that was called the, um, uh, hmm, I lost my notes here, um, investigator, I think it was. Um, and the generator would create an image the investigator would test that image based upon its own database to determine if it looks sufficiently human. And they went back and forth, back and forth until the software that created the image basically fooled the software that was supposed to test it. And then they, they used simple, a simple machine to paint the painting. Um, so who's the artist for this? There's been some argument that the software designer who came up with the program that was so good as to create this image, that must be the artist. But then you say, well, that software designer had no idea how that image was going to come out. They just gave it some parameters and this is what happened. So in this case, once again, who's the artist? Is anybody the artist? Does anybody have a right to claim copyright over this? And that's still an unsettled question. Once again, as I said, the copyright office would say, well, what was the human involvement in creating this? They'd probably say there was none, but then we're all sitting here saying, well, this isn't a very good picture, but if the program was better, um, then perhaps it was so good, you'd have to admit that some human was involved somewhere along the line. I will also add that uh, some critics said this was not deserving of copyright because it was ugly. <laughs> um, it, 
I get scared as an attorney when I hear that because copyright is simply supposed to be for a creation. It's not supposed to judge how good or bad it is. Uh, so that's not a very good standard by which we should start deciding if AI generated art should have copyright protection. Um, so let's say we get to the point where we all finally agree AI generated art is indeed art. And that the human who has used that AI program to come up with the art is the creator, the person who is entitled to protect the copyright. Well, there's one additional aspect of this that's really confusing the courts. Uh, and that is when AI uses all those databases to create the art, when does that use of the databases or the data become infringement of existing art? So uh, there was a uh, woman by the name of Kelly McKernan, um, who for two decades posted on a, a, a site called DeviantArt, her free art. Um, and not too long ago, DeviantArt started up a, a um, marketplace where you could go in and put in, I want these various aspects and they would print the art and you could buy it. She did an investigation when a friend of hers said, you know, there's an awful lot of art on there to start looking, looking like yours. And it turned out she's claims that she found over 20,000 images where they basically copied her style. So it looked just like her art because that database had picked up on her style and had picked up on her popularity as an artist on this website and so simply copied it. So she's claiming copyright infringement. Uh, another case that just was argued in front of the Supreme Court last October, um, a woman, uh, Lynn Goldsmith, once again, she's a photographer, took a picture of prints. Uh, it was described as unusual because it caught him in a moment of vulnerability. So he didn't look like the showman. He looked like the worried artist, concerned about how the audience would react to what he was presenting to them. Um, sometime after that, Vanity Fair commissioned Andy Warhol to do some art for Prince. They were going to be doing a story about Prince. He found her photograph, manipulated as we all know that he did, with different coloring and different shading and different pixel uh, levels, that sort of thing. Um, his, his artwork of prints eventually made him millions and millions of dollars, not only in the original uh, silk screens, but in the prints made from that. Uh, Ms. Goldsmith never got a cent out of it because she didn't even, they never actually used the photograph that she took. Uh, she sued the Andy Warhol Foundation for copyright infringement. And they came back and said, we, uh, we, Andy Warhol transformed that picture, that image so much that it's considered fair use. Fair use is a copyright concept that says you can use it and not violate somebody's copyright under limited circumstances. For example, I'm not violating any copyright here because I'm using this for educational purposes and I'm making no money off of this. But if you're using it for profit and you're simply copying it as opposed to completely transforming the image, then that would be a copyright violation. That's not fair use. In this case, once again, they claimed it was fair use because um, Andy Warhol claimed to have transformed it so much that the vulnerability that was part of it was completely eliminated by the time he was done transforming it. And it became a statement on uh, celebrity and, and, um, and money making off of celebrity, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, he described it as flat, impersonal, and mask-like. Um, that has now come in front of the Supreme Court. The district court found in favor of Andy Warhol's foundation. The Court of Appeals said courts should not act as art critics and decide when the feeling of art has uh, an art piece has changed. So that's now in front of the Supreme Court. Their decision has not been rendered yet. Um, 
But the question then becomes, if you're using AI and you're using it to either manipulate existing images or even using bits and pieces of images right down to the brush strokes, brush strokes once again, to create your own art, are you infringing on somebody else's copyright? If somebody takes your art and let's say, Jamal, you've become so popular that people around the world want your art or artists want to be like you and they're not as good as you in a creative aspect, they could take your art, say, I want it just to look like Jamal's and what happens to your copyrights at that point. Um, there's one other thing I want to say, and this is sort of going off topic for a moment. Um, the problem with these databases, whether you're talking about art or anything else, is these databases tend to reiterate bias, discrimination, presumption. So if you're using an AI program, let's say, for example, to determine policing of neighborhoods where you might hear gunshots, for those of you who've been following the news about this no pro these new programs bought by Cleveland, um, they tend to focus on the neighborhoods that are traditionally demographically poor or people of color, because in the databases, you will find that there are more people arrested in those neighborhoods, so they're automatically adjudged to be more risky. Um, you could say, well, that's because there was discrimination in the past. People of color got arrested more than white people did for a given crime. Uh, the police were there more often than they would be in a white neighborhood where people, neighbors took care of things amongst themselves. Um, so, of course, our criminal database is repeat, re full of bias and discrimination, and that's why you start making police decisions on that AI uh, programs that use that database, it's going to be biased and discriminatory. I noticed the same thing happened here in the art. Um, you put the images of cowboy in a tuxedo. I quickly Googled it. 25% of cowboys in American history were men of color. Did you see any men of color in any of those images? They were all white. So the bias of the program of, I guess, the Marlboro Man as the, the uh, stereotype cowboy is what was repeated here. I had to change the prompt to get a black guy. Hmm. So that's a whole nother issue besides what I've been talking about that I just want to raise quickly. Um, so, how am I doing? You are good, 52. Excellent. I want to talk now about NFTs. Because <laughs> that's part of AI and art. But then it's not. And let me explain this. What is an NFT? A non-fungible token is what it stands for, which should automatically start bells going off. Um, Non-fungible, what the heck does that mean in that case? What it means is you buy an NFT and it gives you the right to something. It does not, contrary to what you may hear or believe in and of itself, give you rights to art, to, to reproduce it, to own it, to anything that you would traditionally consider if you would go out and buy a piece of art. The best I can describe it is, let's say you're on an airplane and suddenly President Obama sits right down right next to you. That becomes a, a flight that you will remember the rest of your life. You've not paid anything more for that ticket. You, what you get from that is the experience of saying, I sat next to Bill Clinton. There are people who go to a Broadway show and walk out because the star of the show isn't there that night. Even though, you know, Hamilton is great even without, yeah. yes. And yet people will say, well, he wasn't in it. So I'm, I want my money back. Ignoring the fact that what they should be enjoying is this whole new aesthetic uh, level from a Broadway show. So what EF NFTs are selling is what before now was not marketable or uh, monetizable, if you will. And that's 
the sense that you're personally somehow connected to it. So when you buy an NFT, you can buy an NFT for um, a shoe designed by LeBron James. Um, you're not getting the shoe. You're not getting the right to reproduce an image of the shoe. You're getting a right to say, I'm connected to LeBron James because I've got an NFT that only 10 other people can own. Um, I was at a seminar at Case Law School a couple of weeks ago on artificial intelligence and the law. And there were several people talking on a panel um, who said, this is a whole new age of art and the uh, economy of art. People don't want to buy art anymore because who wants to spend millions of dollars on a painting when you can just buy a nice copy and hang it in your living room and that's pretty and that's what you're looking for. What people want to buy is the fact that it's limited edition or that it's an original. And so what they pay for is not the aesthetics of the art piece. They're paying for the fact that they can say, I got something different. And that's exactly what an NFT is. So we should eliminate copyright law for artists because it no longer represents what is the true value of art in the world. What is the true value of the art is the connection you feel to it. And that is monetized simply by buying an NFT. I find a terrifying concept. I find it a stupid concept. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't on that panel, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> so when you buy an NFT or you sell an NFT, for an artist, what you have to remember is it's traditionally just like when you sell artwork, that's, you sell a license to copy your artwork, for example. There's something that goes with, with an NFT called a smart contract, and it's either sold with the NFT or embedded in the NFT. That's what sets forth what you are selling. Are you selling the entire copyright? Are you selling the right to reproduce X number of, some of these things say you can make 10 copies, but you may not resell them. Or you can make 10 copies and not sell them more for more than 10,000, something like that. You can manipulate it however you want. But I, I've heard people say, once you sell an NFT, that means anybody can copy the art and um, you've made the money off the NFT. And when they resell the NFT, you can, share in that resale value, but you've lost the control of your art. And that is not the case at all. You still own that art and the copyright to that art, just like the good old days. So um, I, I was gonna say, I'm just gonna stop there. So that's good, okay. <laughs> Take all your questions. We're going to just pull Jamal and Alan's questions. And then we're going to do questions and then we'll have to do questions. So I've got a couple more people to talk to. I'll let you find who gets what chair. Uh, okay. And please let us know if the questions were generated by chat GPT. There we go. So, yeah, yes, do perfect. Do that, and we'll just. Uh, yeah, when you were talking about the uh, the two hunts of software dueling with each other, mm -hmm. trying to determine which one was right or wrong or fake or whatever, that almost sounds like the artistic variant of the Turing test. You know, trying to convince one or the other which one's human or not human right. or whatever. Comments? Because um, the Turing test, I guess, hasn't been worked out. <laughs> no, I mean, and what he's referring to is named after uh, Edward Turing's history. Uh, Alan Turing, Alan, yes, yeah. uh, who broke the Nazi code in World War II. Uh, great photographer, uh, came up with a concept that someday when uh, one computer could not tell that the output of another computer was not by a, a human, by, but by a computer, was when you will realize that you met the ultimate standard for artificial intelligence. Um, as you can see from the picture, the, the program that was generating the art was of limited worth, and the program that was testing it was likewise of limited worth because it passed it as good enough. So I don't think that that test has been met yet. Um, I will say that uh, when I talk about standards that should be in place for using artificial intelligence 
for anything from uh, products like autonomous vehicles to uh, uh, medical opinions that all AI should have some sort of testing to it because AI will pick up on the misinformation in databases and repeat that as if it's true fact. It's funny to say that with ChatGBT. It's not so funny when the autonomous vehicle is driven off the road or the medical professional has missed the diagnosis because the, um, the AI came up with bad information. I'm going to uh, hand the mic to the people doing the questions so that they can pick it up online. So, yeah, if you prefer or not. Uh, this is a question that reveals how little I know about this. But, Jamal, once you develop the program yeah. or develop the image, how is it translated? I mean, you were talking in it about oil painting, but is it like Something you then take in to Photoshop and make sub screen. Yes, you can. You can do whatever you want to it. So even if you just wanted some reference to some painting, let's just say you were painting something and you wanted to kind of get a reference on what you might look for. I mean, if you wanted to design a logo, right? You want to get some inspiration, then you can go in there and just design whatever you want. It's got some limit on. At some point, you have to take it like. To a, you're doing a poster. You have to take it to a printer in some way. Yes. To have it physically produced. Yes. Yeah, so you just download it and email it to Kinko's. And <laughs> Not everything is high tech. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you can do it online, right? So you can upload it. So like I talked about the Etsy. So Etsy is a market we can sell stuff. Right, so you could do a search on Etsy and see what hot topics that people are, are trending. Let's just say coffee posters. People like these coffee images to put in their kitchen, right? So you can compete with a lot of these artists and pictures of coffee because you can come up with some uh, images of a coffee poster and then you could just bring that into Canva.com and just add some text on top and then upload that to the Etsy market. And now you're selling products, they're drop shipping, right? So you're familiar with drop shipping? Of course not. <laughs> so drop shipping is as it's drop shipping is somebody who fulfills that order for you. So you kind of arbitrage in between creating the artwork and then supplying that order for you. So you upload your image to it, people buy it, and then that company, third-party company, prints it and ships it to the buyer. So you don't have to house all your products and stuff. So t-shirts. So if I want to start a t-shirt company, right? I can set up a website and I can get some images of my brand or whatever and add some AI components to it if I like. And then you can connect that to a website called like Printful and Printful will fulfill those orders for you if you don't feel like having a thousand t-shirts in your living room. <laughs> Uh, Jenna, two questions about the uh, program that you were describing at the beginning of the lecture. Yes. Um, you showed lists of painters and photographers. Um, were those limited lists, like drop downs, that are available, or you, mm -hmm. can you enter the name of any artist, any photographer that you could think of? Yeah, so the prompts is up to you. So okay. you're limited by your prompts and what you put in. So you have to research to see what you can see, what other results people are getting. Right, so you got two pieces. You got the Discord where you're generating the images, and then you have justmeajourney.com where once you generate the images, you have access to your portfolio. Right, so now you can look and see what other people's portfolios are. So if I'm trying to get a different result, so I'm not really getting it, I can just do a search for logos, right, for whatever, for a fitness company, and then I can see what prompts they're using, I can just copy those prompts, go back into the Discord, and paste those in there. If I want to change the lighting style and things like that, you can do that. So between using YouTube to see what other people are generating and just kind of doing a search on prompts, you can get the results that you want. So it's just like, you don't know what you're going to get. It's like the lottery. So you just type in something to see it if you like it. So you can read, right? You can redo that. You can do variations of that. You can bring an image in there, and it'll describe that image to it. Okay. So this is yeah, Stephen Bonkers. One thing I want to add to that, an additional 
intellectual property issue when he's starting to the name artists. Some people are now claiming that's a trademark violation mm -hmm. because the artists are using their name as their brand. And when you say, I want something that looks like Jamal Collins, mm -hmm. you're you're interfering with his right to sell, use his name exclusively for his own product. What's wild about it is that when I was doing this presentation, I didn't even know I, I wasn't doing this. We never did that. I didn't know you should do that, so it's just like wow. There's like a lot of stuff that I learned. But this would be, I was sitting with part of that conversation that you were referring to, um, but this is the first time I've done you know been in a room where people were discussing. So I started at the back of the room and I kept picking up <laughs> so I can see the names of the at the bottom. But I'm going to go back to this question because what you're saying. I, you know what you said is you you talked about the process, but the artists that are listed that we some of them we obviously recognize, um, that they are there because there is a thought that they're just by listing their names and getting the, the pieces or the product that they're we're, we're seeking when we drop it on their name, we assume that it is our right to have that to be able to get that information. Am I understanding that when you asked the question, I wasn't sure. What I was getting in terms of the answer. That's because of my own angst. Well, first of all, it's not your ignorance because it's very confusing. <laughs> um, I, the way to answer that is if you were looking for a piece of art that looks like something that would come from the Maple Thorpe genre, um, that's one thing because that's just being used as a sort of an educational or exploratory thing. If you say, I want to buy, something that looks like maple thorpe it'd be like saying um i want something that looks like a bmw but is not made by bmw <laughs> but looks close enough uh bmw is not going to appreciate the knockoff company that is selling the car to say this says it's just like bmw so that's the way to think of a trademark standpoint and it is that process and and because of that you're saying you, you associate the name with with a ownership if you mentioned you mentioned yeah. yes you associate the name with the good the brand the brand the name is the brand for the good the product um and then like i said also then you have the copyright issue of the program actually took my style and and tried to copy it because that's what people were looking for well that becomes sort of the essence of a copyright violation I wanted to say something. You have like film industries that need to come up with set designs, right? So you can quickly come up with some concepts real quick on how you want to do these shots and things like that. You even have AI that you can shoot a movie with just using some props, right? So I can put this on the table and make it into some buildings because the AI will kind of turn it into something else. So the speed of coming up with some concepts to say, I was a Nike, a Nike, and I wanted to have a new store and this layout and I can do the layout real quick. Another thing topic just came up that he didn't really talk about is that now you have companies not hiring models. Yeah. Right. So they're using AI models. So it's like, you know, one of the questions is it's like, is this threatening? He didn't talk about that either, but probably, mm -hmm. um, is this threatening um people's jobs? Mm -hmm. Right. So you got people of color not getting in these roles of being models because you know, Nike's just out putting some fake models. So, so I think this, yeah, this sort of goes to what they were saying. Um, when we were looking at the list of artists that the AI is actually drawing from in order to give you those styles to pick, is it actually just a style or is it looking at all of the work by Picasso that's on Google? and sort of determining the style of Picasso, or is it, you know what I mean? Is it is it like using those Picasso paintings that it finds on the internet to determine what the style of Picasso is? Is that how that kind of works? Um, yes, in fact, here's an interesting argument I found online. On one hand, a particular artist said, well, they're, they're copying my style right down to the brush stroke. And, the response from the somebody that was against that said, "Well, it's just a brush stroke. Brush stroke mm -hmm. that's purely mechanical. So mm -hmm. if it's focusing on just the mechanical nature of your art, how can it be copying you? 
But then the artist says, well, because my style is part of my style is my brushstroke. And I think when you think about, uh, you know, when people try to find fakes, one of the things they look at brushstroke, you know, so how can you say that that's not integral to the, the artist's own work, their own renditions, their own um, process of being an artist? Mm -hmm. This is more of a detail, but I never would have identified that quote unquote Georgian portrait as a Georgian portrait. Right. Yeah. But nonetheless, is there, is, is copyright come far enough along? Are there artists such as like Gilbert Stewart who would be in public domain? Or is artists who died more recently? Oh, sure. Are still alive? There's, could there be a distinction there? Just like, uh, I can't remember, we were watching a movie. Oh, it was a cooking show. And I noticed that all the background music was old uh, classical concerts that uh, of artists that had died so long ago that their work was now in the public domain. So that's a nice cheap way of giving music behind the cooking show. Uh, so yes, if you wanted to copyright Da Vinci, or I mean copy Da Vinci, um, you can make as many reproductions of that or twist it around using an ad program as you want because there's no copyright available for Da Vinci or any of his descendants at this point. I have a question. Uh, could you, both of you, if you want, um, talk about what you didn't mention, which is that the AI models themselves are human creations. And so you can't take, make it sound like, uh, it sounds like sometimes we think of AI as this kind of magical thing, but it's not. It's it's the output of human engineering. Uh, we didn't touch on, on that at all. <laughs> well, I would say yes and no. AI programs, the initial creation of that AI program is by a software engineer or more, one or more. Um, but as AI programs get more sophisticated and use what's called machine learning, they can actually change their own programming to the point that the program that is running now is very different than the program as it was sold or created by the software engineer. So if you're talking about an autonomous vehicle that has crashed a self-driving car, can you say that product was defective because the software program drove it off the road or could the car manufacturer and say, when I put it out in the, in the market, it was just fine. The same thing could be said when you think about the artistic aspects. Um, if the AI program is designed so it learns how to be a better artist, and to be to capture more aesthetic ideals, depending on what those are. Um, at one point, has it completely eliminated the human from the design process because it has designed itself to run differently than the human that put it out there on the marketplace? And I don't know what that means in terms of who gets to be the artist in that case. Then we have time for one, one more, more question, question, and then I have one else to do. <laughs> that I got two minutes to. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, if you want to use AI to sort of supplement your art. So you, you start out with a photograph that you took and then want to embellish it and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, or you start out with a painting that you did and you have a photo of it and you want to do stuff to it. Does that photograph uh, become part of the... Do you, do you lose the rights to that photograph? It becomes part of the... <laughs> As a creator, you become the copyright holder the minute you're done with that creation. It is quote unquote published. So the minute that Stu pushed the shutter button, whatever you call that little button there, um, <laughs> you got it. He has created a piece of art that he has copyright over. It doesn't even have to be printed for a photograph. What you do with that at each stage that you are manipulating it is yet another piece of art that you've created that you were the creator. So you have the copyright for all those various derivations of the original artwork. Even though somebody else can later use that in their uh, manipulation. Well, 
But if they use it, but it still looks like yours because they have not transformed it, they're violating your copyright. All right, so I got one final one, and um, it is on Zoom. And also, big shout out to Kelly Pontoni, who was running the Zoom chat. So thank you very much out there in the ether. Um, so the anonymous question is, if there is no copyright in the AI created images, what about original traditional works, painted by hand, etc., that copy that image very precisely, rather than transforming it in a way that could be considered fair use? If the hand painted image looked exactly like the AI image, would that new work be copyrighted by the artist? <laughs> I think it, it's like a mirror reflected in a mirror reflected in a mirror. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How many angels on the head of a pen? Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you copyright, the, if you copy the original artwork, so it looks exactly the same, and the original artwork had no uh, copyright protection, you have no copyright protection. You have simply copied something that's in the public domain, and anybody can copy it. For you to get your copyright, you have had to manipulate it in some way that makes it materially different to the viewer, um, whether it's from an aesthetic standpoint or in some cases, what the Supreme Court is dealing with now is how meaningfully different does it affect you? That's the Andy Warhol versus the, uh, the, the photograph. So if you have taken a, um, a Jackson Pollock and you created the, recreated the spatter exactly, you have no copyright over that. Um, although he's, I'm not, never mind. You have no copyright over that. Um, if you had like used an AI program to actually take that splatter and make it three dimensional and twist it on the side and, and maybe even then print it out using a, 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 a 3D printer, you've created a whole new piece of art and you have the copyright over that at that point. All right, I, I think that brings us home. So, uh, so if you all got enough food for thought, I'd like to have another hand for our amazing presenter, Jamal Allen, Allen. Um, and again, thank you to Kelly for helping on Zoom, for Mindy for running everything from the back, and all of you for doing this. Please, if you have more questions, I think everybody is really open to it. And thank you all for being here today. Have some snacks and look at the membership as we do step up. So. Thank you.